Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. Throughout the early stages of this year, we have looked at the first two Streets of Rage games and what overall impact the titles had on the world of gaming. In today's video, we are going to look at the third game from this classic trilogy and take an in-depth look at exactly what it brought to the table to help try and separate it from the pack. Some controversial decisions were made with this one, some of which would cause a fair amount of outrage at the time. But despite this, is Streets of Rage 3 a worthy sequel to one of the greatest beat-em-ups of all time? Was the trilogy rounded off with the most refined edition in the series? Well, let's find out. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the mad story of Streets of Rage 3 and why it caused outrage. Yeah! The original Streets of Rage game, released back in 1991, was a huge commercial and critical success. The game was inspired and heavily based off of the creation of Final Fight, the classic Capcom arcade game that saw a Super Nintendo port early in the platform's life cycle. Sega saw an opening to easily top this game, as the scaled down console port of Final Fight only offered one player support. So Streets of Rage was programmed to offer two player cooperative play and was developed to offer more fleshed out fighting mechanics too. The game was obviously hugely popular and gave consumers an early reason to choose a Mega Drive over a Super Nintendo. With any cash cow comes a sequel, and when it came to Streets of Rage 2, Sega went above and beyond to ensure that the second entry in the series was bigger and better than arguably any game that had come on the whole Mega Drive platform before it. Development of this game was a huge undertaking, especially when you consider that the game saw release just one year after the original game. This was only made possible due to a huge collaborative effort between Sega and five other development houses who all worked in unison to ensure that this title was one of the greatest ever made. As you can tell, the plan was executed absolutely perfectly, resulting in not just a great arcade style beat-em-up, but a beat-em-up that was arguably better than any game from the genre that could actually be found in the arcades an absolutely crazy achievement come to think of it. Everything about the game offers close to a perfect gameplay experience, from the game's stunning visuals that were painstakingly refined before being given approval, to the impressive combat mechanics that were heavily influenced by Street Fighter 2. This game was next level stuff and was made even more memorable thanks to the god tier music in the game that was mostly composed by Yuzo Koshiro. What a game Streets of Rage 2 is! As expected, the second Streets of Rage game was yet another huge commercial success for Sega, so the creation of a third entry in the series would be a no-brainer for the corporate entity. The only problem you could argue that Sega had here is that how do you top a game that is already near perfect? So let's begin looking at Streets of Rage 3 and see exactly what Sega did to try and tackle this tall challenge. Streets of Rage 3, known as Bare Knuckle 3 in Japan, would once again be a title with an ambitiously short development cycle for such an important game. The game would release in Japan in March of 1994, just 15 months after the release of the second game in the series. Just like with the development of the first two games, a lot of heart and passion was put into the game. Sadly, so much so that not even all of the ideas could even be used as demonstrated by this early pre-release screenshot, illustrating a section of the game where the players got to ride motorcycles. The game, whilst published by Sega, was once again developed in yet another collaborative effort with Ancient once again, a development house with Yuzo Koshiro at the helm, who we shall speak about more later in the video. As mentioned earlier, there was a huge jump in quality between the first two Streets of Rage games, due to most areas of the second entry being more refined than that of the first. When it came to Streets of Rage 3, Sega and Ancient would set out to achieve a similar feat. In order to try and make this reality, Streets of Rage 3 would be programmed to include a more complex plot, character dialogue, even more multiple endings, longer stages, increased difficulty options, 
more in-depth scenarios and even faster gameplay. So let's talk about some of these elements and how they impacted on the game's overall quality. The plot of the game once again revolves around the series antagonist, Mr X, the leader of a dangerous crime syndicate. This time around, Mr X has started a questionable research company known as RoboSci Corporation. As part of his evil scheme, he has brought Dr Darm on board, the world's best roboticist. Together, they look to replace every important official in the city with realistic looking robots. This is hoped to be achieved by placing bombs around the city as a distraction for the police to deal with. This brings us to the game's character lineup. Axel Stone, Blaze Fielding and Eddie Skate Hunter all return to action. This is a result of being contacted by the game's new playable character, Dr. Zan, who discovers what Mr. X's research corporation was really for. So Dr. Zan, along with three of the older cast members, set out to save the city from villainy once again. In terms of the title's gameplay, like the two previous Streets of Rage games, the entry is yet another arcade-style side-scrolling beat-em-up, in which up to two players must fight their way through waves upon waves of enemies. The three returning playable characters handle similarly to the previous instalment, but the new character, Dr. Zan, brings something a bit different to the table. Zan is a robot who automatically converts every weapon pickup into a ball of energy, which he can utilise against his foes. Speaking of the game's characters, another way this game differed from previous instalments was that this game was the first in the series to feature additional playable unlockable characters, all of which we shall discuss shortly. But for now, let's check out this title's level design and narrative progression. After the game's Star Wars-esque opening text crawl and then choosing a playable fighter, Character dialogue boxes show the characters having a conversation about whether Dr. Zan is telling the truth, whilst they are disposing of the city's first bomb. This then brings the player or players into the opening stage, which takes place in a warehouse. Instantly, players will notice that graphically, the game looks very similar to Streets of Rage 2. It also features many of the exact same enemy sprites and appears to be running in the same engine. In some ways, we could look at this as a lazy effort, but then again, why try and fix something when it is clearly not broken to begin with? Later in the stage, you must take on suited and booted gun wielding enemies as you progress further through this area until you arrive outside fighting on a dock. The stage continues to throw up an assortment of enemies from the first game, including those that can ride motorbikes. During this section of the stage, many enemies also arrive via a speedboat, which makes good use of the watery backdrop effects. As the stage progresses, so does the passage of time, and we go from daylight to sunset as we near the stage boss. What makes the first boss interesting is that Shiva is also one of the game's playable characters, who can be unlocked by holding down the B button after defeating him, a first for a Streets of Rage game. After beating the South Pier Warehouse stage, the player progresses to the Downtown stage, which starts out with featuring a backdrop that looks very reminiscent of the ones from the opening stages from the first two Streets of Rage titles. There are neon lights aplenty, and the whole thing just feels very well Streets of Ragey. During this part of the stage, a mid-boss fight occurs against an evil clown and a kangaroo. Upon defeating these odd opponents, the kangaroo is freed offering the player another unlockable character to play as. Nice! The next part of the stage takes place in what appears to be a nightclub, with lasers and lighting effects aplenty, with a crowd in the background to add to the stage's overall look. The lights even flicker on and off, offering a strobe-like effect to add to the overall experience. Very innovative level design in my opinion. A boss fight takes place on this stage in the bar area against athletic twin female opponents, Lisa and Mona. Intricate details are added to the backdrop of this scene, including aquarium walls behind the bar and glass bottles falling from the top of the bar as the battle commences. After finding a note in the bar about the whereabouts of the syndicate, stage 3 takes place on the District K construction site. Combat starts out in this stage whilst the player dodges barrels falling from above. Hmm, a construction site in a location based on New York City, featuring falling barrels? Is this a not so subtle nod to Donkey Kong? Apart from dodging the barrels, players must be careful not to fall down pits, 
This is the first stage in the game where there are more than just enemies to worry about. The latter part of the stage puts further pressure on the player, as they must punch their way through concrete barriers, Chuck Norris style, to avoid being hit by the auto-scrolling bulldozer that is hurtling towards the player. Again, some really fresh level design for a Streets of Rage title. Next in the stage, we return to more familiar ground. Red beams are plenty whilst traversing an enemy field moving lift. Classic beat em up action and typical scenery. Atop the construction site is the next boss encounter, which takes place against your character's robotic doppelganger, proving once and for all that everything Dr. Zan said was true. Progress into the next stage, the cast find a concealed door that leads to an underground stage, featuring a railway track with fast moving carts that must be avoided by players as they plough through waves of enemies. This area that functions as the syndicate's trade route begins to look more mind-like as you progress. The boss fight takes place against a red armoured samurai named Yamato, who has the power of creating clones of himself in the fight. Whilst we will touch more on the music later, this part of the game is particularly interesting as it features remixed music from the opening stage of Revenge of Shinobi. After defeating Yamato, it appears he was guarding the Syndicate's hideout, which is where the next stage takes place. Surprisingly, the Syndicate's hideout has a very eastern feel to it that feels more like the lair of Save the Yakuza than it would a New York City crime syndicate. Tangents aside, I think the level looks fine, it just doesn't really fit the theme of the game very well. Soon the player finds themselves within Mr X's skyscraper, first brawling their way through an elegant hallway, then through an elevator section for further classic beat em up trope action. At the top of the tower, Mr X can be found sitting in his gold plated Trump Tower like throne room. Mr X watches you defeat waves of enemies, and bearing in mind that this is not the final stage, I assume you can guess what happens next. The Mr X the player faces is yet just another robotic doppelganger. The following stage starts with the player fighting their way through more lavish hallways, defeating Terminator-like robots, before going down in a lift to defeat gangsters, dominatrixes and other recurring enemies. During this stage, the team save the head of the city's police force, before progressing to the outside of the building to face off against classic-style jetpack-wielding adversaries, like in the previous game. The onslaught continues until Adam from the first Streets of Rage game makes a surprise appearance, gunning down the enemies in a helicopter, reuniting the old friends. On the next level, we are brought behind enemy lines to a woodland-like area as the players progress closer to the end of the game. Finally, the characters arrive inside the RoboCide Corporation's factory, where they must traverse moving conveyor belts and dodge lasers whilst facing off against both robotic and human opponents alike. As you have probably noticed by this point, it seems that the game has taken a great deal of influence from the likes of Terminator and Robocop, which is a change of pace from the martial arts focused theme of the previous game. Even the boss fight in this stage takes place against Tech. The stage does not quite end here though, as next you meet the real Mr X, who is now just a brain in a tube, reminiscent of Mother Brain from the Metroid series. The final fight takes place against a powerful robot who must be defeated in 3 minutes, before Mr X uses his bombs to blow up the whole city. Upon finishing this game, the ending of the game varies depending on which difficulty setting the player completes the game on, giving the game an extra edge of replayability and giving gamers an incentive to play through the game again on more challenging difficulty settings. Endings are also triggered by events that happen through a playthrough, for example if the player is unable to save the police chief in one of the latter stages, then an alternative final stage takes place in a location that is supposedly the White House, where you take on Shiva once again. Defeating him triggers the bad ending, where he reveals Mr X will finish you, who happens to be watching the whole thing through a monitor. Looking at all of the stages throughout this game, it is clear that many elements are recycled from Streets of Rage 2, but at the same time the game offers enough to stand on its own two feet. Speaking of the changes, it is also of note that although combat remains largely similar, there were still tweaks to it all here and there. For example, only Skate could run in the previous game, though now all of the characters have that ability.
On top of this, enemy AI was also expanded, so more enemies can pick up weapons, block attacks, employ cooperative attacks, and even steal exposed food items to regain health. Also, blitz attacks, which were a staple of the previous game, can be upgraded through successive play, and a rechargeable meter allows players to perform a special attack without losing any health when full. The overall level design paired with the accompanied dialogue make the story in the game more important than ever before, thus giving the player even further incentive to fight to continue to see how the game's story progresses. Another element that needs talking about when making a Streets of Rage 3 video is of course the game's music. As mentioned earlier, the game features music from the very same composers as the previous game. The majority of consumers preferred the music found in Streets of Rage 2 over this new entry. However, the composers of the music in both games cite that the music for the title is very much in line with the game's overall theme. Motohiro Kawashima states, With Bare Knuckle 3, we got rid of even more of the human element. We were really trying to crank up the meter with what we were making for that game. I think that's what Kushiro-san had in mind. He wanted us to give 3 a more decadent feel, I think. Yoshiro himself adds, It's the kind of soundtrack that leaves you wondering where the melody is. It took a bad beating from listeners at the time. I remember hearing people say that it wasn't even music. It was really experimental, and I made it believe in that kind of era was on the horizon. In terms of the music found in Streets of Rage 3, it was not the only aspect of the game that was controversial with the title's release, as there was other big changes too, the largest of these being that the western version of this game had been censored and altered so drastically that you could almost argue that they ended up being two completely different games. Streets of Rage 3 was released at a point in time where Sega of America had surpassed their prime, and heavy-handed localization policies were now running rampant throughout the branch of the company. It was almost as if we were now in a time where Sega did what Nintendo did, which would help explain how Sony managed to begin to dominate the video game industry just one year later. The localization of Bare Knuckle 3 to becoming Streets of Rage 3 did not just censor the game, it involved often completely removing features. This included vastly changing the story, making it riddled with plot holes and often missing out key scenes. Bizarrely, Sega of America would even up the difficulty for the international release, which can be speculated was put in place to prevent consumers from completing it when renting it from Blockbuster Video, so that they buy the game outright for themselves at a later date. Sprites were often changed colours which led to inconsistencies with box art, and in a very Nintendo-esque move, Sega of America would order the adage of more clothes to more scantily clad female characters. You would think the game was Final Fight on the Super Nintendo, eh? In regards to the localization, they would also remove a mini-boss and secret playable character from the game known as Ash, simply due to perceiving the character as being a homosexual. What was perceived to be politically correct in the 90s in America was vastly different to that of today, and simply was not a nation of people who were as progressive as the Japanese were at the time. All of these aggressive changes to the title would result in some of the game's reviews even being hurt and becoming more critical as a result. Some review sources were urging gamers not to bother with the American version of the game and to instead just import the Japanese game so that players could get the real experience. Many reviewers also thought the game was too similar to Streets of Rage 2, with GamePro commenting that the game is little different from previous entries in the series. Not all reviews of the title though were negative, with EGM praising the game for its new moves and larger levels, though they did criticise that the soundtrack was well below Yuzo Koshiro's usual standard. As a result, they scored the title an average 7.25 out of 10. Across the board, many publications responded in a similar fashion. Fast forward into 2020, many years after these controversies took place, as a whole trilogy, the three games are viewed as simply one of the greatest series of all time. In Internet Land, the third instalment doesn't seem to get the same level of praise as Streets of Rage 2, but neither do people have often many bad things to say about the game either. From my perspective, 
I personally think the jumping quality between the first game and the second game was an impressive one and a leap that was so great that it could simply not be replicated with the third title. I guess a good comparison for this would be comparing the Streets of Rage games to the original Star Wars trilogy. If Streets of Rage 2 is The Empire Strikes Back, then the third entry is their Return of the Jedi. Streets of Rage 3 offered much of the same quality as the second instalment, but Koshiro's bold, controversial choice in music arguably holds the game back from reaching the same level of acclaim. Atmosphere is everything, and the music in 2 helped bring the game to the next level. Yuzo's musical arrangements in Streets of Rage 2 was like adding the right seasoning to a medium rare steak. It brought out the best in the flavouring. Streets of Rage 3 was unable to pull off this same feat, but Koshiro still looks at the game's soundtrack as some of his personal best work ever, even if other people neither like it or understand it. Saying all of this, I can perfectly understand why many left comments on my previous videos proclaiming the third entry as their favourite game, as the title is very similar to Streets of Rage 2 except it offers a wider array of characters to play as and better constructed stories to follow. So in spite of all of the localization, outrage and controversies, I think that Streets of Rage 3 is a fine ending to the Streets of Rage trilogy, which I guess adds further to the demand for Sega to publish a Streets of Rage 4, which I shall certainly be covering on here on release. To be fair, even though it hasn't arrived yet, it seems to have delivered its fair portion of outrage itself already, so I look forward to delivering juicy content on that one later in the year. Overall though, today's video has been the mad story of Streets of Rage 3 and why it caused outrage. Censorship and cutting content from games is rarely cool and consumers and journalists expected better from Sega at that time. At least we can easily emulate both versions of the game today which is at least something. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of Streets of Rage 3 and whether you are looking forward to Streets of Rage 4. Hit the subscribe button and let me know down below. Finally, my channel is partially funded by the generous donations I receive via Patreon. Patrons can earn a credit and a shout out at the end of these videos. These people make working full time on YouTube just that little bit easier, so I would like to thank all of you very much for that. Huge shout outs go out to Carl Johnson, Sebastian Velez, Sponge Matt B, House of the Ted, JD Robbins, Synth Spaces, Andrew Bazanski, Asobi Quang DX, Michael Baker, Tom Elliott, Computer Man, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Daniel Daly, Retroversion.com, Dan Barley. Junior, Joel, and all of my other patrons. Yeah.